So what I want to talk about today is I want to just say a little bit more about triangulations. And uh, by the way, I should warn you that I, I think what I'm what I'm going to say today is not in the book. It's not in Ziegler's book. Um, I'm just going to tell you the the very beginning of. I mean, I, we talked last time a, a little bit about triangulations and. We'll, we'll see several times that triangulations are a very useful tool. Uh, but they're also kind of a, a topic on their own. And uh, I just want to kind of scratch the surface, tell you a little bit about it. And if you want to know more, there's actually this really nice and very new book. It just came out like a couple months ago uh, by Jesus de Loera, George Rambao, and uh, Paco Santos. Um, and if you want, so if you like what I do today, then maybe that's a good place for you to. to Keep looking, okay? So I, I already told you last time that uh, every, well, we talked about what a triangulation was. So, so a triangulation is basically taking a polytope and cutting it up into simplices, okay? And we saw last time that that can always be done, and also that it can also that it can always be done in a in this cool way, where you just take the polytope, put it in a dimension higher, and then lift lift the points and just kind of look from underneath and, and see what you see. Those are called regular triangulations. Um, and what I want to talk about today is I want to talk about polytopes where you can say more about the triangulations of them. Okay, and um, I'm actually going to start with a case that, even though it's very it's it's relatively simple, I think it's already very interesting. Okay, and it's the case of triangulating a polygon. So, for example, if if I want to triangulate a pentagon, then there's a bunch of ways to do it, right? Here's one, okay? Um, actually, let me just do them all. Drawing five pentagons because I already did this ahead of time and I know that there's five ways. Um, and it turns out actually that no matter how hard you try, they, they all look like this. They all, they all look exactly like, like this. You just draw the diagonals coming out of a vertex. This is only true for. Um, did I mess up? I haven't repeated anything. So those are the five the five triangulations. Okay. In general, for high, for higher n, there's other ways, but but for pentagons, it's kind of boring. This is the only way. Uh, what I want to do is that I want to say. I want to count the triangulations of of, a, of an n-gon. Okay. I'm going to call that c sub n, the number of triangulations, of and n plus two gone. You'll notice that I'm I'm often lazy and I, I write like this for triangulations. Okay, this means triangulations. So, for example, here I'm illustrating that c sub three is five because the three plus two gone, in other words, the five gone, can be triangulated in five ways. Okay. What about C sub 2, how many ways are there to triangulate a foregone? So quadrilateral, and remember that here everything is convex, so it's a convex quadrilateral, so you just get to draw either diagonal. There's two ways. How many ways are there to triangulate a three-gone? One, right? How many ways are there to triangulate a two-gone? So what's a two-gone? Well, it's a pot. It's, I'm going to call it the straight line. How many ways are there to the, the segment? How many ways are there to triangulate a segment? There's there's one which is because because you're in you're in you're in one dimensions, and in one dimension, a simplex is an edge. 
so the, so the edge is already triangulated. Okay, so that's one. Um, well, if you've uh, taken a combinatorics class before, then maybe you find this notation suggestive, and maybe you also find this list of numbers suggestive, and maybe you can tell me what the next one is. Can you? 14. So why do you know Dito? Because you memorized the sequence. Um, so this is a very famous sequence of numbers. It's called the sequence of Catalan numbers. Okay, and if you've never seen before, then if you've never seen this before, then there's no reason that you should guess that this is uh, the next number in the sequence. But it is. These are called the Catalan numbers, and here's a proposition: c sub n plus one is equal to the sum from k equals 0 to n of c, k, c, n minus k. So this says, for example, that if I didn't know how to compute c sub 4, then one way of doing it would be to draw all the possible triangulations of the 6 gone, and you'll find that there's 14 of them. But this tells you that you don't have to do that. You just have to say, look at all the ways of, of multiplying Catalan numbers that add up, whose indices add up to 3. Right? If you want n plus 1, they want, you want them to add to n. So 1 times 5 plus 1 times 2 plus 2 times 1 plus 5 times 1. That's 14. Okay. And the proof is actually not hard. What I'm going to do is the following. I'm going to say, okay, well, here's my n plus 2 gone. Let me maybe, maybe label the vertices 1, 2, up to n plus 2. Okay. And... Uh, in a triangulation, there has to be a triangle containing the edge 1, 2, right? You don't, we don't know which one it is, but it's somewhere. Let's say that it's this one, for example, OK? And I'm going to call this number k plus 2, OK? So. Let's ask ourselves, how, how many ways are there to triangulate this polygon if I'm forcing you to include this triangle? Well, basically, you just have to finish the triangulation by triangulating this and triangulating this. right? How many triangulations does this have? Well, it's C sub something. You just have to be careful uh, what the indices are. right? So, how many vertices does this polygon on the left, on the right side, have? K. Okay, are you sure? It could be k minus one. It could be k plus one. It could be k. What is it? Um, they're labeled from from two, three, up to k plus two. Normally, we like to count starting at one. So, if instead of starting at two, I started at one, then instead of getting k plus two, I would get k plus one. This is hard. I. I it's always. It's always. It's always easy to be off by 1 when you do these things of counting the numbers from A to B. Between A and B, there's B minus A plus 1 numbers. It's confusing, but it's true. So there's K plus 1. I'm not, serious, I'm not, I'm not kidding. This is hard. I've, I've made this mistake a million times in my life. Uh, so this is a K plus 1 gone, right? And uh, what about this one here? Between k plus two, between k plus two and n plus two, there's how many numbers? N plus two minus k plus two plus one. So here I have n minus k plus one numbers. I'm, conf I'm confused now. No, the thing is, the thing is that I gave this guy the wrong name. I wanted this to call this number k plus three. Yeah. That's what I wanted to do. 
And if I call the k plus 3, then between 2 and k plus 3, I have k plus 2 numbers. We agree? Now, between k plus 3 and n plus 2, I have n minus k numbers. And then plus 1. Wait a second. And this, I told you this is hard. <laughs> no, 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 I'm happy, I'm happy. M plus 2 minus K plus 3 plus 2. So this should be N minus K plus 2. Yes? This is hard. I think you should just you should just do it. It's hard to do it in front of you guys, but it, it is n minus k plus two. Yeah. Yeah. N minus k plus one. So what am I doing wrong here? Tell me. Uh huh. Those are all the first two, so it's minus n to the power of the second Uh huh. You know, the those plus the one you already found, you have to add up minus one still. Uh huh. So do the subtraction, and then you can get n minus k plus one. I mean, I agree that this is n minus k plus one, but what I don't like is that I'm trying to prove this, and it's not proving it. No, it's n minus k plus two. K plus two. So we'll just say. C sub n is the number of triangulations of the n plus 2 gone. Okay? So, yeah. The hardest thing is to do this live in front of you guys. But in any case, the, the, the point is this, that Basically, you're going to have to you're going to have to choose some vertex to join to one and two, and that's your choice of the value of k. And once you've chosen that that number, then what what is left to do is to triangulate this thing, and there's c sub k ways of triangulating it, and triangulating this thing, and there's c sub n minus k ways of triangulating it. Okay, and the point is that these two triangulations are independent of each other. It doesn't really matter what you do here; that doesn't affect what you do here. So those are two choices that are independent. So I have to multiply these two things and then add over all the values of, of k. So we're trying to get the k sub n plus 1. That's exactly what the problem is. That's exactly what the problem is. Thank you. <laughs> uh, c sub n plus 1 is the number of triangulations of the n plus 3 gone. So this is the, this is the from 1 to n plus 3. And now it all matches. Now there's really k plus 2 things here and n minus k plus 2 things here. Thank you, Michael. So I probably have a typo in my, no, in my notes I have it. Correct. You see, I just, I just need to <laughs> follow what I write. OK? But that, OK, so but the point is, if I use the triangle 1, 2, and k plus 3, then I have c sub k times c n sub n minus k triangulations. OK? And I have, to I have to choose which one of these triangles to use, so I basically have to add up over all, all the possible values of k. OK? That's the proof. By the way, if, if you ever, so, so these Catalan numbers are beautiful. They're fascinating. They appear all over the place. Uh, there's so many different problems in combinatorics and in other fields for which the answer is the Catalan numbers. Um, Richard Stanley, so if, if you Google Stanley Catalan, then you're going to get a PDF file of dozens of pages. And it has about 150 different questions for which the answer is the Catalan numbers. 
Um, and this is one of the one of the most important ones. And the proof always goes like this: you want to you want to solve something. You basically always just split the problem into two problems and solve the left problem and the right problem. Okay, so that, that's a recursive way of finding the Catalan numbers. But uh, you might know that actually there's a more direct way of computing them, which is that there's an explicit formula. The Catalan number is just 1 over n plus 1 times 2n choose n. And uh, so now I'm going to prove that for you. And the proof uses a technique called generating functions. This is a technique that if, if you know it, then hopefully you love it. Uh, that's a wonderful book if you, don't, if you want to know more about it. It's a book called Generating Functionology. Um, and um, well, if you don't know it, this is the first time you're going to do it, and we're going to do it a lot in this class. So, yeah, it's a it's a free PDF. So that's a that's a very nice. Actually, let's let's give him free advertisements since he so nicely um, gave the book for free. Generation functionology. This is the, the, te the technology of generating functions. So what we're going to do is the following. We're going to say we're going to define the power series whose coefficients are these Catalan numbers. Okay? It's an infinite power series. And uh, here there's two schools of thought, and they're both valid. If you like analysis, then you're free to worry about convergence rates and such things, uh, convergence radiuses and such things. But it turns out actually that uh, a lot of us combinatorialists are not the biggest fans of analysis. And you know, we, if, if you force us to, then we'll think about it. Um, and analysis is sometimes of, I mean, I, let me, let me, let me st say one thing, which is that if, if people tell you that you should only learn one side, don't believe them. It's very important that, that, uh, that you learn all the different kinds of mathematics, but you probably have your preferences, and my preference is that if I don't have to worry about uh, convergence radiuses, then I don't want to. Okay? And it turns out that all of, all of this theory of generating functions, um, you can pull it off without worrying. Uh, for most of the things that we want to do, you can pull it off without worrying about convergence uh, or any of this by doing all computations in, in what is called the ring of formal power series. And this is something that you have, might have encountered in your algebra class. This is, a, uh, this is the ring of formal power series. In other words, these are all the things of the form sum of alpha n x to the n, n greater than or equal to 0, and all the alpha i's are complex numbers. And uh, the operations in this ring are addition is just addition, and multiplication is just multiplication term by term, collecting terms together without worrying about convergence. Okay? So in a way, you can think of this. Actually, the, I, I like the way that Wilf talks about it in generating functionology. It's, it's just kind of a clothesline where you hang your sequence. Okay? So instead of, instead of uh, keeping track of the whole sequence, then you think of it as a, as a close line where you say 1x to the 0 plus 1x to the 1 plus 2x to the 2 plus 5x to the 3. And, you're, and when I say this, it's just the close line of the sequence. Okay? But then we're going to use the, uh, a lot of the manipulations that you might do in an analysis class. But if you think about it, these manipulations most of the time are algebraic. And then at the end, you worry a little bit about convergence. But the point is that if you do all the computations in here, then you don't need to worry about convergence. So then, I'm going to square this. Okay? Why? Because that summation looks like a convolution to me. Okay? So let's see what happens when I square this. I get summation of CNX to the N twice. 
Okay? And then what's the coefficient of x to the n here? Well, in order to get an x to the n here, you need to multiply an x to the k coming from here and an x to the n minus k coming from here. Right? Here this is with coefficient ck, and here this has coefficient c n minus k. So when you multiply those two things together, you're going to get c k c n minus k. And you're going to get one, one term x to the n for each value of k. And k ranges between 0 and m because it's x to the n is what you have to get, right? So we get this. And that's just an algebraic manipulation. But then the nice thing about this is that this is the summation of n greater than or equal to 0 of this, which is just cn plus 1, x to the n. Okay, which is almost getting your 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 sequence back. Okay, let me multiply both sides by x, so I get that this is equal to summation n greater than or equal to zero of c n plus one x to the n plus one. Okay, and then you'll notice that this is exactly c of x, but with the first term missing, right? c of x minus the first term is missing. And what's the first term? It's uh, c0 x to the 0, which is just a 1. OK? So this is very often what you do with this, with this business of, of uh, generating functions that you, you give your closed line a name, but then you use the properties of your sequence to turn them into a property of your closed line, of your, of your generating function. So instead of writing this, what I get is this algebraic equation for my generating function. Okay? And then, well, I, I know how to solve that equation. And this is where... Okay, you want to be a little bit careful. Um, but basically, I mean, ba basically what, what you're going to do is, is apply the quadratic formula, right? And you have to worry a little bit. The reason that I say you have to worry is that, is that we're living in this, in this place where there might be some issues, but it turns out that there are no issues, okay? I mean, maybe, maybe let's just... Maybe let's just do it so that you see what I'm what I'm doing. Okay, let's put the cards on the table. So, um, what's the thing that I don't want to quite use the quadratic formula because you learned the quadratic formula as something about numbers, okay? And these aren't exactly numbers. <laughs> so let's let's do it, but let's do it a little bit more carefully. Okay? So how do you derive the quadratic formula? You complete the square. You, you, you probably remember this because you have to teach pre-calculus, right? So we complete the square. So how do you do it? Well, we need to make this thing a square. So that means we have to multiply by... First, let's make it a square, okay? Okay. And then we can say this. Please don't let me make a mistake here. This is crucial. This is a difficult moment. One fourth minus x. Yeah. And let me multiply by four. So you get this equals one minus four x. And then, so I'll, I'll take any worries. Well, um, just using the quadratic formula, I'm not giving what you end up with there. Just, just go on and go with it. 
Okay, so basically what I, what I want to say here is now let's, let's take square roots of both sides. And, and the thing is that I am going to claim, and uh, I'm going to claim this without proof, but um, it's actually not hard. What I'm going to claim is, I mean, Okay, well, here's a problem already. Do you agree with this step? We have a plus or a minus solution, right? Okay, so there, there's something to say there. Uh, which one is it, the plus or the minus? And what does this mean? Square root of 1 minus 4x. Let's maybe maybe let's talk about the second question first. So what, what does one minus four x square root mean? Well, let me write it like this. But let's put a plus or minus, okay? And we'll we'll figure out in a second if it's plus or minus. How can I make sense of this expression? If this were your analysis class, well, what could you do here? So uh, you could do a Taylor series, and actually it turns out that you don't even uh, I mean, this is this is just a binomial, right? This is you can you can use Euler's binomial theorem and say that this is summation of one half choose n um, times minus four x to the n. So. So here I'm using the binomial theorem, and, and then what I'm saying is that actually the binomial theorem holds in, in, this, in this context. Okay? Now, is it plus or is it minus? Think, think about the, the Taylor series of this thing. What does it look like? Or what's the first term? Let me, let me put it that way. The, the first term of this thing is a 1. So it's 1 plus blah, blah, blah. But here in the first term is a minus 1. So, that mean, so that's why actually it's the minus. OK? And so then what I get is that c of x is equal to 1 minus summation n greater than or equal to 0 of 1 half choose n minus 4x to the n divided by 2x. OK? So maybe it's a good moment to recap. So I started by using this recursive formula for my sequence. Then I defined a power series formal power series using that sequence, and I turned the recurrence into an equation for that power series. And then the nice thing is that actually, um, through some algebraic manipulations, I managed to find a formula for my power series. OK? And then. The point is that now I can use this formula to get to extract the coefficients. What, what's the coefficient of x to the n here? But but looking at this one, what is it? How can you get an x to the n? from this expression. You see, actually, I mean, th this is really term by term. This is giving you the, the, the power series expansion of this thing, right? Much easier than that. Exactly. If, if I want to get an x to the n, then because I'm dividing by x, what I need is the coefficient of x to the n plus 1 in here, in, 
in the numerator divided by 2, right? Because of this 2. And what is the coefficient of x to the n plus 1 in the numerator? Well, it's this ugly thing. 1 half choose n plus 1 times minus 4 to the n plus 1. And then I divide by 2. Okay? But what's the coefficient of x to the n in, in c of x? Well, by definition, it's c sub n. Okay? So somehow what I just showed is that c sub n is equal to this. Okay, maybe that's not what we expected, but that's that's what we got. C sub n is equal to this. Okay. And again, l let me put the cards on the table, and let me say that if you if you l either like analysis or if you have to take the GRE soon, then it might be a good exercise for you to figure out the convergence rates here, and the, com the convergence radiuses, and you can do it, and it's it's not hard. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's hard. Uh, and if you're lazy and you want to not do any analysis, then there are ways of, of arguing that this argument is completely algebraic and, uh, and you don't really need to worry about convergence. Okay? So it's a choose your own adventure thing here, whether, which way you want to do it. And it's possible in both ways to do it. The point is that this conclusion is true, that C sub n is equal to this, and how do I reconcile with what I actually wanted? C sub n equals, what did I say? Uh, a half choose n plus 1 times minus 4 to the n over 2. Okay? Maybe one thing I should ask you is, have you ever seen a half choose anything? <laughs> so maybe yes, maybe not. I think you're more likely to have seen r choose n than to have seen a half choose n. So. I think it's a little, when you see concretely a half there, it's maybe a little bit more off-putting than, than this really is. The point is that R choose n is defined for any real number, and this you learn in your analysis class. Uh, R choose n is just R, R minus 1, R minus 2, up to R minus n plus 1 over n factorial. That's what it, this is the definition, okay? And the binomial theorem says that this is true. For any real number, OK? So somehow R choose n is what it has to be so that the binomial theorem is true. Okay? And it, so what, so let's just spell out what this half choose n plus 1 is then, okay? I'm going to do this kind of quickly, but I get that. A half times a half minus 1, a half minus 2, up to a half minus, here I'm doing choose n plus 1, so I get minus n plus 1 plus 1. Okay? Over n plus 1 factorial times minus 4 to the n divided by 2. Okay? And I'm not going to be scared of this. I'm going to multiply it out. So what's a half minus 1? It's minus a half. A half minus 2 is minus 3 halves. How far does this go? I get a half minus n, right? Because I get minus 1 plus 1. So what is a half minus n? It's minus... 2n minus 1 over 2. Okay? So I get basically all the odd numbers multiplied by each other. So I get this. Okay? And I, we better hope for some cancellation. Um, let's. 
let's first take the numerator, OK? So 1 times, and let's take the signs out. 1 times 3 times 5 dot 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 up to 2n minus 1. So those are the, those are the, these numbers that are multiplying here, OK? Now, how many minus 1s do I have here? We better hope an even number, because this is supposed to be the answer to a counting problem, right? So we should be getting a, a positive number here. But you see here, we have how many odd numbers between 1, 3, up to 2, and minus 1? We have exactly the first n odd numbers. So we have n minus signs here, and we have n minus signs here. So that means that the minuses cancel out. So that's good. So did I just lie then? Uh, <laughs> oh yes, minus, minus, minus. Thank you. Thank you. Keep checking on me. This is this is tricky to get all correct. Minus and minus, minus and then plus one. So now I get one minus, then n minuses, and then n plus one minuses, which means. 2n plus 2 minuses, which means no minuses. OK, okay. how many 4s do I have? I have 4 to the n plus 1. How many 2s do I have here? I have n plus 1 things multiplying here. What am I missing? Um, I'm missing this 2. And I'm missing this n plus 1 factorial. OK? So we're getting somewhere. 4 to the n plus 1 divided by 2 to the n plus 1 is 2 to the n plus 1. Divided by 2 is 2 to the n. So we get 2 to the n over n plus 1 factorial times 1 times 3 times 5 times 2n minus 1. OK? And now let me just pull off a nice trick here. Because I kind of want to say that this is like a factorial, but I skipped all the, all the even terms. So let's put them in. OK, so I haven't done anything. I just multiplied by 1. Now, what's, what's the top? The top is just 2n factorial. Okay. I divide by n plus 1 factorial. And what is the bottom here? Almost. It's, this is 2 times 1. This is 2 times 2, 2 times 3, 2 times 4, up to 2 times n. So let me take the 2's out. There's n twos. And then I get 1 times 2 times 3 up to n, which is n factorial. So that cancels. And I get 2n factorial over n factorial, n plus 1 factorial. And now that's actually equal to that. Why? Because n plus 1 factorial is the same thing as n plus 1 times n factorial. And this is 2n choose n. Okay. I told you I was going to do this quickly because because I want to get to other things. Uh, but that's a proof. Okay. That's that's a proof that uh, that's the formula for the Catalan number. Okay. And uh, and I think it's a very nice proof. I also think it's a bit of a messy proof, but uh, it's an interesting and very roundabout way to get to an explicit formula. But actually, the point that I want to make to you is that this is pretty much the simplest proof of this formula. I mean, there's there's other proofs, but. Uh, but I, th I, would, I would say that this is the easiest proof for, for this.
Okay. And if you miss something in all these steps, you can you, you, the video is available and you can watch the slow motion. Okay. Uh, but uh, basically, it's some algebraic manipulation, and we get there. Yeah. So once we have that proof, anything that fits under the Kelly numbers, we only need to show up by guessing from that to the triangulation to the triangulation. Exactly. So now, if you encounter a problem. And you are suspected the solution to that problem is the is the Catalan numbers. Then generally you don't want to bother with any of this stuff again. Generally you either prove that the, the the recurrence is satisfied and then you're done, or you find a bijection between whatever your object is and and these things and you know that these are counted by Catalan numbers. Okay. And that's the name of the game for a lot of. I told you there's 150 Catalan problems. And you don't want to do this argument so many times. And most of the time, the way that you prove that something is counted by Catalan numbers is, is that you just reduce it to something that you already knew was counted by Catalan numbers. OK. Now, I wanted to tell you something else that's very interesting about this story, which is the following. That actually, I want to do the following thing. Let's consider the triangulations. Let's consider all the triangulations of, a, of, a, of an n-gon. But now let's not consider them as independent things. Let's, let's try to figure out how they're related to each other. Okay? What I'm going to do is that I'm going to say that two triangulations are adjacent if I can obtain one from the other one by just flipping one, one diagonal. Okay? So for example, I say that this one is adjacent to what? Well, I, I only get to flip one, one line, so I'm going to keep this one the same. And you see, if I flip this one, then there's only one place that I can put it, which is here. So I say that these two things are adjacent because they they differ only in one diagonal. Yeah. What is our technical definition of adjacent? So I'm going to say that two triangulations T and T prime are adjacent if one way to say it, if, the, if they differ by what I'm going to call a flip. And a flip is taking some quadrilateral somewhere. I mean, let me, let me just. Do it a little bit more schematically. So I take some quadrilateral, and I flip the diagonal. Okay, So maybe one triangulation looks like this. And I flip it so that it looks like this. where this is all part of the triangulation. So flips are, are exactly, you see, if, if I take a diagonal out, then I'm, ex I'm exactly going to leave a quadrilateral, and there's only one other thing that I could do, which is to put the other diagonal. So that's what I mean by a flip. Okay. So what else is this adjacent to? Well, I flipped this diagonal, but I could also flip the other one diagonal, right? So if I flip the other diagonal, then I have to leave this one alone, and I have to flip the other one. Okay. Now, if I leave this one alone, then I get to flip this one, and 
then I get this and this. Okay. So wh what, I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm just drawing the graph of all triangulations where I say that two triangulations are neighbors in the graph if they differ by a flip. And this is the picture that I get for the pentagon. It's a little weird that I, I get a pentagon back. And it's kind of, it's, it's an accident that I get a pentagon back. But it's not an accident that I get a polygon back. And that's, that's the, the beauty of this thing, that no matter what the angon is, if you, if you do this, what you're going to see is a polytope. Okay. And this is very surprising, I think. But it's true. Does it have to mention equal to the number of diagonals in each one? Yes. So that's a theorem. The graph of the triangulations of an angon. is the one skeleton, or we, we've do, or one skeleton is synonym of the graph of, of a polytope. This polytope is called the isosahedron. So this is a beautiful polytope that, well, we know how many vertices it has. Right? So the number of vertices is, is the Catalan number. Okay. Um, it's a very interesting polytope, and there is a lot to say about it. And maybe one reason that, uh, I, mean, I think one a historical interesting thing here is that the first person to discover this was a topologist. This is. Uh, Covered by Stashev in homotopy theory. And if you're interested in, in, in reading a little bit more about the history of this, it, it's, it's interesting. And actually, Stashev's paper is very pretty, and it's very understandable. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so this is, this is uh, I think, the beginning of what tells you that actually these triangulations have a lot more structure than we have talked about so far. Because so far I just said, okay, you know, you can do this. But here we're seeing that actually these, these triangulations fit together in a really beautiful way. Okay? And the remarkable thing is that this is not just a phenomenon about polygons, because this is true of any polytope in any dimension, with a, with a few caveats. Okay? So, What's the theorem in general? The theorem in general is that the graph of triangulations of a polytope, an arbitrary polytope, is the, one, is the graph of another polytope called the, in this case, it's called the secondary polytope. Well, this is, this is almost true, but it turns out that you have to insert an adjective here, which is the adjective regular. Okay. So what do I mean by this? Remember that, I mean, a triangulation is a very, is a very general thing. You just want to take, take this polytope and cut it up into simplices. And last time we discovered this technique of regular triangulations, okay? And regular triangulations are the ones that can be obtained by this procedure that I described last time of immersing the polytope into one dimension higher and then seeing what triangulation that induces, okay? 
all going to the triangulation be gotten from that way, or is it just a specific regular triangulation? So that's, that's the definition of regular triangulation. Okay. The, the definition of regular is that it can be gotten in that way. Okay? And so the fact that I'm inserting this adjective here implies that not every triangulation is regular. But the fact that I inserted it after I stated my first theorem says, suggests that in the plane, every triangulation is regular. OK? So in R2, all triangulations are regular. But in higher dimensions, that's, that's not true. Okay, but this tells you that there's a, there's just a lot of beautiful structure to these triangulations, and uh, in in the homework you you are going to you're going to do this for some simple for some easy polytopes. You're going to dis discover the structure of all the triangulations. Uh, and in general, like I said, I think this is a really beautiful topic. And if you, if you want to know more about it, then that book is the place to start. And, and uh, if you're interested in doing your project about this, then I'm, I'm happy to talk to you um, about con concrete topics that you could, that you could work on. Okay. But I think that's a good place to stop. Just remember that triangulations are beautiful. That's the point of today. <laughs>